Welcome to chapter 10. This chapter is on work and recreation. So the objectives of this chapter are to see the relationship between college education and your work, to examine the factors in choosing a career, to develop an understanding of the process of deciding on a career. Um, other chapter objectives are to explore available choices at work, to identify challenges of changing careers in midlife, um, we're going to talk about retirement, and we're going to talk about how work and recreation are related. Okay, so it's important that we find a healthy balance between work and recreation to prevent um, the burnout that comes from feeling stressed. So most people spend eight hours a day sleeping, eight hours a day working, and then eight hours a day doing like daily routines such as eating, commuting, working out, leisure. Um, but if you don't enjoy your work and find it meaningful, then it can negatively impact your relationships and your feelings about yourself. Since we are spending eight hours a day working, it constitutes a big chunk of our lives. So um, we're going to go ahead and define some terms now that you'll need to know, the first of which is recreation. So recreation is defined as leisure activities meant to restore, refresh, and to put new life into our depleted selves. Um, and it, within that definition is the word leisure, so let's define leisure. Leisure is the free time we control and can use for unpaid activities we choose to engage in because we enjoy them and they are personally meaningful. So the pursuit of leisure activities is associated with improved physical and cognitive functioning, increased happiness, and greater longevity. So it's important that we have hobbies, or things we like to do to relax, um, not only for our mental health, but also for our physical health. And then a career is defined as one's life's work. Uh, it's like the work experience that you have throughout your entire life. It can be one occupation or it can be several different occupations. So an occupation is defined as one's vocation, profession, business, or trade. And it's actually becoming more common for people to have multiple occupations throughout their career. So then uh, we've defined career and occupation, so what's a job? A job is your position of employment within an occupation. It's what you do to earn money. Um, so your occupation may be doctor, but your job would be, for example, cardiologist at cancer in the heart department. Um, and then work is defined as any activity that produces value for ourselves and others. So it should be a meaningful activity that brings you joy. Uh, work is meaningful when you feel that the fruits of your labor are sufficient. So if it's a, a job that you're getting paid at, then you would feel like you're getting paid adequately. Um, work is meaningful when you feel valued and when you enjoy what you're doing. So hopefully your job and your work are congruent um, and that you feel like all of those things are being met. So it's important to use resources that will help you with career planning. For example, some resources are college counselors, personality tests, career centers and fairs, internships, volunteer work, um, inventory tests, like interest inventory tests, which you like to do. Um, it's probably not realistic to decide on one occupation that you will have for the rest of your life right now. Instead, consider a field that's interesting to you that has several possibilities for work. So when I was in college, I chose psychology as the field I was interested in. And then now there's lots of different kind of jobs that I have within the field of psychology, one of which is teaching this class. Okay, so for a good number of college students, college is their work. Um, and so there are some things that you can learn about what type of employee you will be or uh, where you might thrive um, in work as a college student. So what I mean by that is how you approach your education is really a good gauge of how you will someday approach your career. Um, if you find meaning in your work in college, you will likely find meaning in your job. Um, if you're afraid to speak up in class, you will likely be afraid to speak up at work. If you have like a problem with your boss or the way something's being done or an employee, another employee, if you go above and beyond on your school assignments, you're likely to do the same at work. Um, so for some of us, school may be our primary line of work for the present. And so to gain some self-awareness, reflect on why you are in college. Some people go to college for personal development and to gain knowledge. 
Some go to college just to kind of prepare themselves for their career, to meet their career objectives, take the classes they have to take, take the degrees or get the degrees they have to get in order to get the job they want. And then other people go to college just to avoid making other life choices. Um, so a lot of students in, in this stage of uh, their collegiate career kind of consider leaving college. And it's important to know that when people uh, leave college, it's often difficult to return later. Um, it can be harder to find the motivation to go back to school as you age. And this can be due to uh, financial and family obligations that do sort of come with age. Um, and if you are considering leaving college, um, kind of think about why it is that you want to leave. Um, and weigh out if the, you know, the, the pros and cons and if uh, the reasons that you want to leave are, are really valid or if you're just trying to like procrastinate and put something off because um, it's better to just kind of get it over with for most people um, and that way you can focus on building your career and doing what it is you want to do the rest of your life. Although, Eric Erickson does suggest what's called the psychological moratorium, which I think is an interesting idea, and for some people, maybe the right call. Um, and so what Erickson says is that um, before you decide on an occupation or a career, you should take time out from school and travel uh, the world and get internships and talk to people that have the uh, that work in the field you're interested in working in and sort of try it out or, or see what you think about it and learn more about yourself, become more self-aware um, before you pick something. Because there's so many people that just after college, it's like, what do you want to be? And then they're like, um, uh, you know, a nurse. And then they start taking nursing classes and realize it's not for them, you know, or for, of course, for a lot of people it is, but for some people it's not. And then it's like too late, they're already in it. And then they have to change majors. So Erickson says maybe instead of going through that, just like, get to know yourself and maybe intern or talk to some nurses and, you know, figure out what that's like before you just dive in. So that's an alternative idea. Um, things to think about if you're considering leaving college. Okay, so our choice of a career is considered to be an expression of our values and our personality. At an early age, we start being asked, what are you going to be when you grow up? Um, and we can feel a lot of pressure to make a choice about our occupation or our career, but it's actually a pretty complicated decision and, of course, a very important decision. So some important factors in the occupational decision-making process include um, thinking about your level of motivation and achievement. So goal setting is important in choosing a career, but equally important is the motivation to achieve those goals. It's important to understand your level of motivation in terms of achievement. So to do that, ask yourself questions like, what have I achieved in the past? How did I do it? Why was I motivated to achieve that specific goal? And that should give you a good gauge of kind of your level of motivation and how it relates to you achieving things or not. Another important factor in choosing a career is um, thinking about your attitudes about occupations in general. So when we research first graders, they actually have no idea that a janitor is not as high of a status job as a lawyer is. Um, and we develop our attitudes about the statuses of different occupations from our environment. So our school, our family, our friends teach us about what jobs are prestigious and what jobs aren't. And then as we age, um, these rankings become more definite. And most people, you know, they say that they want these higher status jobs like doctor, lawyer, firefighter. Um, so you need to think about um, your relationship to your attitudes about these different occupations and uh, the different statuses and see if having a high status job is something that's important to you or not. Maybe you'd rather not focus on status, but focus on, you know, happiness. Maybe uh, there's, a, when I was little, I always said that I wanted to be a um, person that rode on the back of a garbage truck. <laughs> so, I mean, maybe there's a job that has just really been with you for a long time, something you think would just make you happy and doesn't necessarily have a high status to it. So it's also important to think about our abilities and aptitudes. 
Um, in fact, this is one of the most important factors in choosing a career. So an ability is your competence in an activity. Um, and so you can compare your skills to what the job requires. Um, but it's important to like keep in mind how you developed your perception of your abilities uh, and if it's accurate or not. Maybe your parents told you you were really good at something or really bad at something and that perception of you wasn't necessarily true or maybe your teachers told you, you know, you'd never be able to do math, but actually you love math and you're really good at it, you know. So um, you need to consider how you developed your attitudes about your abilities and make sure they're accurate. One way to kind of check that is to take an aptitude test. So aptitude tests um, measure specific skills or the ability to acquire certain proficiencies. You probably have taken an aptitude at some point in your life, uh, the SAT, the ACT, the GRE. Uh, some jobs will require aptitude test scores or um, they will administer the aptitude tests on, the, their, uh, on their own. Another important factor in choosing an occupation um, is to consider your interests. So interests are defined as one's experiences or ideas pertaining to work-related activities that one likes or dislikes. And so there is a three-step process to assess your interests. The first step is to discover your areas of interest. The second step is to identify occupations in your interest areas. The third step is to determine which of these occupations matches your ability. Um, and so you can take what are called occupational interest inventories, and these are assessment tools that measure one's interests as they relate to various jobs or careers. And they're used to compare your interests with those of other people who have found the job um, satisfying in a given area. For example, there's Holland's self-directed search or the strong interest inventory. Um, generally, you can take these interest inventories with your um, counselor on, on campus. It's also important to consider your values, what's important to us and what we want from life. And we wanna find a job that mirrors these values. There's also kind of a subset of values called work values, and this is what we hope to accomplish through our role in an occupation. For example, maybe our work values are to help other people or to have stability, um, or maybe a work value is to be able to travel. Um, maybe you, you value creativity or status, um, like we talked about earlier. Maybe you want a job that challenges you. Um, maybe you enjoy recognition or competition. It's also important to consider your self-concept. So self-concept is defined as a pattern of beliefs about one's unique qualities and typical behavior. And people with low self-concepts uh, usually don't picture themselves having a meaningful job. They are more likely to choose jobs that they don't enjoy. So it's important to keep in mind that you are worthy of a job that makes you happy and you should go for it. All right, so let's watch a quick video on the uh, strong interest inventory. When you were a kid, you had dreams. Maybe you wanted to be an astronaut or a lion tamer or an inventor of something awesome. But yeah. as you get older, your interests and passions change and you discover other things that you love to do but you have no clue how those interests or passions could actually translate into a real career. On top of that, there's a choir of outside voices that all want to tell you who you are and what you should be. And those voices are hard to ignore, especially if you don't really know yourself. And the tragic thing is, if you don't know yourself or what the best career options are for you, the chances of you ending up here are pretty high. But what if there was a way that you could know yourself and discover jobs that people like you tend to thrive in? Well, the Strong Interest Inventory is here to help. The Strong is a career assessment that helps you discover who you are and explore career paths that are the best fit for you. And this knowledge is powerful because if you know what you like and what you're like, and where the people who are most like you thrive, then you can be free to pick a career that you're gonna love. Think about it. You're going to spend hours and hours and hours of your life working. So why not enjoy it?
So John Holland believes that people are drawn to certain occupations based on their personality. He says that certain personality types are best fit for certain jobs. So with that in mind, it's helpful to kind of identify what your personality type is. And John Holland has identified six major personality types, realistic, investigative, artistic, social, enterprising, and conventional. So if we um, go through each one of them, it's important to understand that you might feel that you have characteristics uh, within several of them, and that's fine. So you just want to kind of think about which ones sound the most like you. So the first one is realistic, and the realistic personality type likes to work with animals, tools, or machines. They generally avoid social activities like teaching, healing, and informing others. They value practical things you can see, touch, and use. Then there's the investigative personality type, and they like to study and solve math or science problems. Uh, they generally avoid leading, selling, or persuading people. The next personality type is artistic, and they like to do creative activities like art, drama, crafts, dance, music, creative writing, um, and they generally avoid highly ordered, uh, structured, or repetitive activities. Then you have your social personality types, and they like to do things to help people, like teaching, nursing, giving first aid, providing information. Uh, they generally avoid using machines, tools, or animals to achieve a goal. The next personality type is called enterprising, and uh, individuals with this personality type like to lead and persuade people and to sell things and ideas. Uh, they generally avoid activities that require careful observation and scientific analytical thinking. They value success in politics, leadership, or business. And then there are conventional personality types, and these people like to work with numbers, records, or machines in a very set and orderly way. They generally avoid jobs that are ambiguous, uh, ambiguous, amb ambiguous and um, jobs that are unstructured activities. So they value success in business. But like I said earlier, uh, you might find that you have characteristics in, in multiples of these, and that's in part because each type shares commonalities with other types. So if you look at the hexagon, um, it kind of gives you an idea of which personality types are related to others. So the hexagon um, will show you, for example, that realistic is related to investigative and conventional, social is related to artistic and enterprising, um, conventional is related to realistic and enterprising. So it kind of gives you an idea of um, the crossover between these different reality, uh, uh, these different personality types. Okay, so let's go ahead and watch a video on John Holland's personality types. In 1959, John L. Holland wrote an article which was published in the Journal of Counseling Psychology entitled A Theory of Vocational Choice. He believed that a theoretical model was needed in addition to the assessment and empirical models which were currently in use in order to determine successful career choices for individuals. He touched on trait factor theory, which proposes that it is more successful to determine a job type a person might be fitted for over a specific job. Holland claimed that both people and work environments can be categorized and then matched to each other stating that development, culture, and external factors like family and social pressure will also influence the type of personality a person develops in relation to employment. The six personality types that Holland proposed are artistic, enterprising, social, conventional, investigative, and realistic. These six types each match specific personality traits and values that can then be paired to a broader job category with specific job types. Some people also may match more than one personality type, thus opening up more jobs that a person may match with. The artistic personality type is considered to be creative, intuitive, and imaginative. Jobs that match this personality type include writer, musician, and artist. The enterprising personality type is considered to be energetic, ambitious, 
adventurous, and self-confident. Jobs that match this personality type include sales, entrepreneurship, and business executives. The social personality type is considered to be humanistic, idealistic, and concerned for others. Jobs that match this personality type include being a teacher or counselor. The conventional personality type is considered to be efficient, careful, conforming, and organized. Jobs that match this personality type include accountant, secretary, and baker. The investigative personality type is considered to be analytical, observant, and inquisitive. Jobs that match this personality type include science, math, and technology. The realistic personality type is considered to be practical, physical, and hands-on or manual. Jobs that match this personality type include gardener, engineer, or military. Collins' theory has been widely used and very influential in the field of career counseling since its inception. However, it is not without flaws. When looking at Holland's theory through a multicultural lens, we must note that Holland's work was intended to address the vocational issues of an individual living in the mid-20th century United States. His work is often criticized by postmodern researchers who state that internationally the values of personality, individualism, and independent decision-making may not be a strong factor in determining career placement for specific minority groups. It is also important to note that the assessments and suggestions for the personality types and employment types were originally written in English, and translations of assessments have tested with poor validity in some instances. Some translated versions of assessments using Holland's model were solely produced for research purposes and are not appropriate to be used with clients in a career counseling setting. It is vital when utilizing this theory and the matching practices to assess a person's personality type accurately and also to ensure that corresponding job categories are matched appropriately. Formally structured and validated assessments are necessary when proactively applying this theory. Having the appropriate training and certification to administer the assessments is vital when utilizing this model and this model should not be applied without utilizing formal assessments. In conclusion, Holland's model gives practitioners an effective way to assess a client's preferences and begin a discussion about possible job types. However, it will be up to the clinician to appropriately apply the model, accurately assess the individual, and determine how a person's individual culture may fit into the values of the client and their career preferences. All right, so what I would like for you to do for lecture activity one for chapter 10 is take the personality test on page 304 and 307. Um, uh, 304 through 307, I'm sorry, and tell me which three personality types in rank order you have the most check marks for. So which, uh, what are your three personality types and rank them, uh, number one being the one that's the most like you, the one you have the most check marks for, and then two, and then three. Okay, so uh, now we're going to talk about deciding on a career. And we're going to start by talking about the factors that make career decision making more effective. The research shows that there's some people that have what's referred to as an adaptive style, and they have the following factors that make um, choosing an occupation or career more effective. So the first one is um, they're good at information gathering. They gather a comprehensive amount of information. Um, they know how to research the job and, and get the information they need to um, know what's expected of them and what they need to bring into the interview. Uh, these people also have an internal locus of control, which is just what we use in the psychology field to describe people that really take responsibility for their actions um, and feel a sense of personal control over outcomes. So um, if they're not getting a job, they're not blaming it on the economy or um, some other kind of external factor, but instead they're saying, okay, what did I do wrong that time? What can I 
do, uh, learn from that situation and then do right on the next interview or whatever. And then another one is the analytic uh, that they have an analytical uh, kind of way of processing information. So they don't take rejection too personally. Um, they don't kind of get all stressed out and anxious if they read a job description and they don't necessarily meet a qualification. They just kind of process that information like it's data um, and they do it objectively. Another factor is that uh, these people that are uh, effective in getting jobs, they procrastinate less and they put a lot of effort into getting a job. Um, they also are fast in making decisions um, and they have less dependence on others and they have less desire to please other people as well. So there are certain steps that you can use to help you in the career decision-making process. Um, the first of which is to begin by focusing on yourself. Consider your abilities, your interests, and your values. Ask yourself questions like, where do I want to live? Um, do I want to work alone or do I want to work other with others? Do I want to work in an office or out in the field? Do I want a lot of structure and supervision from a boss or would I prefer more autonomy and uh, independence? And then another uh, step is to generate alternative solutions. So don't settle on just one job, but consider a bunch of options with what, in one field. So if you want to work in music, you could uh, consider options like being a music producer, a sound engineer, a stagehand, a talent manager, a composer, a music artist. Um, so look at kind of the big picture when you're starting out. The next step is to gather and assess information about the alternatives generated. Read about the different jobs in the field. Ask people in the field. Um, and the next step is to weigh and prioritize your alternatives. So once you kind of figure out, for example, all those jobs that we talked about in the music industry, music producer, sound engineer, stagehand, kind of uh, rank them and prioritize them. So consider the pros and cons of each job alternative and then rank them in order of most desired to least desired. And then the next step is to make a decision and formulate a plan. So figure out the preparation necessary to get into your field of interest. What classes do you need? Internships, work experience, uh, licensing, headshots, uh, a curriculum vitae, wh whatever it may be. Um, and then the next step is to carry out that decision. So start putting the plan into action. Be knowledgeable of how to interve uh, interview well, how to write a good resume, how to find job interview uh, job opportunities. And then the last step is to get feedback. So once you're actually in the job, uh, you want to assess if this job is right for you or if you should work towards another position within the company or pursue, pursue other opportunities within the field or pursue a completely different field altogether. Okay, so let's watch a TED Talk on how to choose a career. Wow, what an honor. I've always wondered what this would feel like. Uh, so eight years ago, I got the worst career advice of my life. I had a friend tell me, Scott, don't worry about how much you like the work you're doing right now. It's all about just building your resume. And I'd just come back from uh, living in Spain for a while, and I joined this Fortune 500 company. I thought, this is fantastic. I'm going to have this big impact on the world and all these ideas. And within about two months, I noticed at about 10 a.m. every morning, I had this strange urge to want to slam my head through the monitor of my computer. I don't know if anyone's ever felt that. And I noticed pretty soon after that that the, all the competitors in our space had already automated my job role. And this is about, right about when I got this sage advice to build up my resume. Well, as I'm trying to figure out what, <laughs> as I'm trying to figure out what you know, two-story two window I'm going to jump out of and you know, change things up, I read some altogether different advice from Warren Buffett. And he said, building, taking jobs to build up your resume is the same as saving up sex for old age. <laughs> and I heard that, and that was all I needed. Within two weeks, I was out of there, and I left with one intention, to find something that I could screw up. That's how tough it was. I just wanted to have some type of an impact. It didn't matter what it was. And I found out pretty quickly after that that I wasn't alone. It turns out over 80% of the people around don't enjoy their work. I'm guessing this room is different, but that's the average that Deloitte has done with their studies. And so I wanted to find out, what is it that sets these people apart? The people who do the passionate, world-changing work, they wake up inspired every day, and then these people, the other 80% who lead these lives of quiet desperation. 
And so I started to interview all these people doing this inspiring work. And I, I read books and, and did you know, case studies and 300 books all together on purpose and career and all this. Totally just self-immersion, really for the selfless reason of I wanted to find the work that I couldn't not do, what that was for me. But as I was doing this, more and more people started to ask me, Scott, you know, you're into this career thing. I don't really like my job. Could we sit down to, for lunch? I'd say, sure, but I would have to warn them because at this point, my quit rate was also 80%. Of the people I'd sit down with for lunch, 80% would quit their job within two months. And this is something, I was damn proud of this. And it wasn't that I had, it wasn't that I had anything special magic. It was that I would ask one simple question. It was, why are you doing the work that you're doing? And so often, their answer would be, well, because somebody told me I'm supposed to. And I realized that so many people around us are climbing their way up this ladder that someone tells them to climb and ends up being leaned up against the wrong wall or no wall at all. And so the more time I spent around these people and saw this, this problem, I thought, what if we could create a community, a place where people could feel like they belonged and that it was okay to do things differently, to take the road less traveled, where that was encouraged and inspire people to change. And that later became what I now call Live Your Legend, which I'll explain in a little bit. But as we've done this, as I've made these discoveries, I noticed a framework of really three simple things that all these different passionate world changers have in common. Whether you're you know, like a, a Steve Jobs or if you're just you know, the person who has the bakery down the street, but you, you, you're doing work that embodies who you are. I want to share those three with you so we can use them as a lens for the rest of today and hopefully the rest of our life. The first part of this three-step passionate work framework is becoming a self-expert and understanding yourself. Because if you don't know what you're looking for, you're never going to find it. And the thing is that no one's going to do this for us. You know, there's no major in university on passion and purpose and career. I don't know how that's not a required double major, but don't even, don't even get me started on that. I mean, you spend more time picking out a dorm room TV set than you do you know, picking your major in your area of study. But the point is, it's on us to figure that out. And we need a, a framework. We need a way to navigate through this. And so the first step of our compass is finding what our unique strengths are. What are the things that that we wake up loving to do no matter what, whether we're paid or we're not paid, the things that people thank us for. And StrengthsFinder 2.0 is a book and also an, uh, an online tool, highly recommended for, for sorting out what it is that you're naturally good at. And then next, what's our, what's our framework or our hierarchy for making decisions? You know, is it the people that, or do we care about you know, the people, our family, health, or is it achievement, success, all this different stuff? We have to figure out what it is to make these decisions so we know what our soul is made of so that we don't go selling it to some cause we don't give a shit about. And then the next step is our experiences. We have, all of us have these experiences. We learn things every day, every minute about what we love, what we hate, what we're good at, what we're terrible at. And if we don't spend time paying attention to that and assimilating that, that learning and applying it to the rest of our life, it's all for nothing. It's like every week, actually every day, every week, every month, of every year, I spend some time just reflecting on what went right, what went wrong. And what do I want to repeat? What can I apply more to my life? And even more so than that, as you see people, especially today, who inspire you, who are doing things where you say, oh God, what Jeff is doing, I, I want to be like him. Why are you saying that? Open up a journal, write down what it is about them that inspires you. It's not going to be everything about their life, but you know, whatever it is, take note of that. Because over time, we have this repository of things that we can use to, to apply to our life and have a more you know, passionate existence and make a better impact. Because when we start to do, put these things together, we can then define what it is success actually means to us. And without these different parts of the compass, it's impossible. We end up in the situation, we have that you know, scripted life that you know, everyone seems to be living going up this ladder to nowhere. It's kind of like in Wall Street too, if anyone saw that, the, the kind of peon employee asked the big Wall Street banker CEO, said, hey man, what's your number? Everyone's got a number. If they you know, make this amount of money, they'll leave it all. He says, oh, simple, more. He just smiles. And it's, it's the sad state of most of the people that haven't spent time understanding what actually matters to them. We just keep reaching for something that doesn't mean anything to us, but we're doing it because everyone said we're supposed to. But once we have this framework together, we can start to identify the thing that makes, things that make us come alive. You know, before this, a, a passion could come and hit you in the face. Or uh, maybe in your possible life work, you might throw it to the side because you don't have a way of identifying it. But once you do, you can see something that's I'm, I'm, it's congruent with my strengths, my values, who I am as a person. So I'm going to grab a hold of this. I'm going to do something with it. And I'm going to pursue it and try and, try and make an impact with it. And you know, Live Your Legend and the, the movement we've built wouldn't exist if I didn't have this compass to identify, wow, this is something I want to pursue and, and, and make a difference with. So if we don't know what we're looking for, we're never going to find it. But once we have this, this framework, this compass, then we can move on to what's next. And that's not me up there. 
Um, but doing the impossible and pushing our limits. Because you know, there's two reasons why people don't do things. One is because they tell themselves they can't do them. Or the other is people around them tell them they can't do them. Either way, we start to believe it. And either we give up or we never start in the first place. The thing is, everything was impossible until somebody did it. Every invention, every new thing in the world, people thought were crazy at first. Roger Bannister in the four-minute mile, it was a physical impossibility to break the four-minute mile in a foot race. And so Roger Bannister stood up and did it. And then what happened? Two months later, like 16 people broke the four-minute mile. The things that we have in our head that we think are impossible often just, just milestones waiting to be accomplished, if we can push those limits a bit. And I think this starts with probably your physical body and physical fitness more than anything, is we can control that. You know, if you show yourself, you don't think you can run a mile, you show yourself you can run a mile or two or even like a marathon or lose five pounds, whatever it is, you realize that can be transferred, that confidence compounds and can be transferred into the rest of your world. And I've actually gotten into the habit of this a little bit with my friends. We, we had, had this little group where we kind of go on physical adventures. And recently, I found myself in a kind of a precarious spot. I, I'm terrified of deep, dark blue water. I don't know if anyone's ever had that same fear ever since they watched Jaws 1, 2, 3, and 4, like six times when I was a kid. But anything above here, if it's murky, I can, oh, I can, I can already feel it like right now. It, <laughs> I, I swear there's something in there. Even if it's Lake Tahoe, it's freshwater. Totally unfounded fear, ridiculous, but it's there. Anyway, three years ago, I find myself on this tugboat right down here in the San Francisco Bay. It's a rainy, stormy, windy day, and people are getting sick on the boat, and I'm sitting there wearing a wetsuit. And I'm looking out the window in pure terror, and thinking I'm about to swim to my death. I'm going to try and swim across the Golden Gate. Uh, and, and my guess is some people in this room might have done that before. And I, I'm sitting there, and my, my buddy Jonathan would talk me into it. He comes up to me, and he could see the state I was in. And he comes up and says, Scott, hey, man. He's like, What's the worst that can happen? He's like, you're wearing a wetsuit. You're not going to sink. He's like, and if you can't make it, just hop in one of the 20 kayaks. Plus, if there's a shark attack, why are they going to pick you over the 80 people that are in the water? So like, oh, thanks. That helps. He's like, no, but really, just have fun with this. He's like, good luck. And he dives in, swims off. I'm like, OK. Well, it turns out the pep talk totally worked. And I just felt this total feeling of calm. And I think it was because Jonathan was 13 years old. <laughs> and of the 80 people swimming that day, 65 of them are between the ages of 9 and 13. Think for a second how you would have approached your world differently. At 9 years old, you found out you could swim a mile and a half in 56 degree water from Alcatraz to San Francisco. What would you have said yes to? What would you have not given up on? What would you have tried? You know, as I'm finishing this swim, I get to Aquatic Park, and I'm getting out of the water, and of course, half the kids are already finished. So they're cheering me on, and they're all excited. And I'm, I got total popsicle head, if anyone's ever swam in the bay. And I'm trying to just uh, thaw my face out. And I'm watching people finish. And I see this one kid, something didn't look right. He's just flailing like this. And he's barely able to sip some air before he slams his head back down. And I noticed other parents were watching too. And I swear they were thinking the same thing I was. This is why you don't let nine-year-olds swim from Alcatraz. <laughs> and I mean, it, this was not fatigue. All of a sudden, two, two parents run up. They grab him. And they, they put him on their, on their shoulders. And they're dragging him. He's just dragging like this. And I mean, totally limp. And then all of a sudden, they walk a few more feet, and they plop him down in his wheelchair. And he puts his fists up in the most insane show of victory I've ever seen. I can still feel the warmth and the energy on this guy when he, when he made this accomplishment. I, the thing is, I had seen him earlier that day in his wheelchair. I just had no idea he was going to swim. I mean, where is he going to be in 20 years? How many people told him he couldn't do that, that he would die if he tried that? You prove people wrong, you prove yourself wrong, that you can make these little incremental pushes of what you believe is possible for yourself. You don't have to be the you know, fastest marathon in the world, just your own impossibilities to accomplish those. And it starts with little bitty steps. And the, the best way to do this is to surround yourself with passionate people. The fastest way to do things you don't think can be done is to surround yourself with people already doing them. There's this quote by, uh, by Jim Rohn, and it says, yeah, you are the average of the five people you spend most time with. And there is no bigger life hack in the history of the world from getting where you are today to where you want to be than the people you choose to put in your corner. They change everything. And it's a, it's a proven fact. In uh, 1898, Norman Triplett did this study with uh, a bunch of cyclists. And he would measure their times around a track in a group and also individually. And he found that every time the cyclists in a group would cycle faster. And it's been repeated in all kinds of walks of life since then. And it proves the same thing over and over again, that the people around you matter. And an environment is everything. But it's on you to control it, because it can go both ways. With these 80% of people who don't like the work they do, that means most people around us, not in this room, but around everywhere else, are encouraging complacency and keeping us from pursuing the things that matter to us. So we have to manage those surroundings. You know, I found myself in this situation 
uh, what uh, personal example, maybe a year ago and a couple years ago, has anyone ever had a hobby or a passion they pour their heart and soul into? Unbelievable amount of time, and they so badly want to call it a business, but no one's paying attention, and it doesn't make a dime. <laughs> okay, I was there for four years trying to build this Live Your Legend movement to help people do work that they genuinely cared about and inspired them. I was doing all I could, and there were only really three people paying attention, and they're all right there. My mother, father, and my wife, Chelsea. Thank you guys for the support. But I, <laughs> and that's how badly I wanted it, but it grew by 0% for, for four years. And I was about to shut it down. And right about then, I met, I moved to San Francisco and started to meet some pretty interesting people that had these crazy lifestyles of adventure, of businesses and websites and blogs that surrounded their passions and helped people in a meaningful way. And one of my friends, now he has a family of eight, and he supports his whole family with a blog that he writes for twice a week. They just go back from a month in Europe, all of them together. This stuff blew my mind. It's like, how does this even exist? And I got unbelievably inspired by seeing this. And instead of shutting it down, I decided, let's take it seriously. I did everything I could to spend my time around, like every waking hour possible, trying to hound these guys with hanging out and having beers and workouts, whatever it was. You know, after four years of zero growth, within six months of hanging around these people, the community at Live Your Legend grew by 10 times. In another 12 months, it grew by 160 times. And today, over 30,000 people from 158 countries use our career and connection tools on a monthly basis. And those people have made up that community of passionate folks who inspire that possibility that I dreamed of for Live Your Legend so many years back. The people change everything. And this is why, you know, you asked what, what was going on. Well, for four years, I knew nobody in this space. And I didn't even know it, it existed, that people could do this stuff, and you could have movements like this. And then all of a sudden, I'm over here in San Francisco, and everyone around me is doing it. It became normal. So my thinking went from, how could I possibly do this? to how could I possibly not? And right then, when that happens, that switch goes on in your head, it ripples across your whole world. And without even trying, your standards go from here to here. You don't need to change your goals or anything. You just need to change your surroundings. That's it. And that's why I love being around this whole group of people, why I go to every TED event I can and watch them on my iPad on the way to work, whatever it is, because this is the group of people that, uh, that inspires possibility. And we have the whole day to spend together and plenty more. Sum things up in terms of what we, these, these three pillars, you know, they, they all have one thing in common more than anything else. They are 100% in our control. No one can tell you you can't learn about yourself. No one can tell you you can't push your limits and learn your own impossible and push that. No one can tell you you can't surround yourself with inspiring people or get away from the people who bring you down. You can't control a recession. You can't control getting fired or getting in a car accident. Most things are totally out of our hands. These three things are totally on us. And they can change our whole world if we decide to do something about it. And the thing is, it's starting to happen on a widespread level. I just read in, in Forbes, the US government reported for the first time in a month where more people had quit their jobs than had been laid off. And they thought this was an anomaly, but then it's happened three months straight. In a time where people claim it's kind of a tough environment, people are pretty much giving a middle finger to this scripted life the things that people say you're supposed to do in exchange for things that matter to them and do the things that inspire them. And the thing is, people are waking up to this possibility that really the only thing that limits the possibility now is imagination. That's not a cliche anymore. Like, I don't care what it is that you're into, what passion, what hobby. If you're into knitting, you can find someone who is killing it knitting. And you can, you can learn from them. It's wild. And that's what this whole day is about, to learn from from the folks speaking and what we, we profile these people and live your legend every day uh, because it shows people when ordinary people are doing the extraordinary and when you can be around that, it becomes normal. And this isn't about being you know, Gandhi or Steve Jobs doing something crazy. It's just about doing something that matters to you and makes an impact that only you can make. As we, speaking of Gandhi, uh, he was a recovering lawyer, as I've heard the term, and he was called to a greater cause, something that mattered to him he could not do. And he has this quote that I absolutely live by. First they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then you win. Everything was impossible until somebody did it. You can either hang around the people who tell you it can't be done until you're stupid for trying, or surround yourself with the people who inspire possibility. The people who are in this room. Because I see it as our responsibility to show the world that 
what's seen as impossible can become that new normal. And that's already starting to happen. For us to do the things that inspire us so we can inspire other people to do the things that inspire them. But we can't find that unless we know what we're looking for. We have to do our work on ourself, be intentional about that, and make those discoveries. Because I imagine a world where 80% of people love the work they do. I mean, what would that look like? You know, how would, what would the innovation be like? How would you treat the people around you? Things would start to change. And as we finish up, I have just one question to ask you guys, and I think it's the only question that matters. And it's, what is the work you can't not do? Discover that. Live it. Not just for you, but for everybody around you. Because that is what starts to change the world. What is the work you can't not do? Thank you, guys. Sometimes people get in a job and then there are certain aspects of that job that they might not be in love with um, and they don't really do anything about it because they feel kind of stuck and powerless. But it's important to remember that you do have choices at work. Um, so the first thing we're going to talk about here are the dynamics of discontentment at work. So sometimes people aren't happy at work not because of the actual work which they may like, but um, due to the factors of the job, like maybe they just don't like the people that they work with or their boss or there's really low morale. Um, one of the things that can create discontentment at work is bullying. So bullying on the job can create anxiety and depression and reduce your effectiveness at work. 35% uh, of Americans report being bullied in the workplace. Employees who view the world through a negative lens are likely to take out their frustration on coworkers. Uh, so that's generally who we see being the bullies. They're not like the happy, upbeat people in the office. Um, abusive supervisors may pose an even more challenging problem than abusive coworkers because they have um, that power inherent in their role. Other factors that can lead to discontentment are having like sales quotas or task deadlines, um, forced competition that a person isn't really comfortable with, job security being threatened um, on a consistent basis, um, people that feel like they're in a job where there's really no opportunity for promotion or upward mobility can be discontent. Um, people that have to work with difficult customers or clients, people that have to work long hours, tedious tasks, or drive long commutes um, are more likely to not be so happy at work. Um, another thing to consider uh, while you're at work is kind of how it makes you feel in terms of yourself. So self-esteem at work um, is something that is important to think about. Many people equate what they do with who they are. And when they experience a job loss, for instance, they may question their judgment, um, their priorities, their ideals. So if you lose your job, um, you may feel a loss of identity and a subsequent decrease in your self-esteem. And so it's important during this time that you really stay in touch with your friends and family um, to kind of keep the loneliness at bay. And another thing that's important to do is to create meaning in your work. If you are experiencing uh, unhappiness at work, <clears throat> focus on the factors within your job that you can change. Maybe you can't quit the job, maybe you really need it, um, but maybe there are some things that you can change. So even if you can't change your job, maybe you can change your hours or the location that you work or your attitude. Try to look at things as a challenge instead of looking at them as a hassle. Um, kind of, you know, play those mental games with yourself if necessary. Um, and if you must remain at an unsatisfying job, another thing you could do is find something outside your job that fulfills your needs for recognition, significance, productivity, and excitement. So it's important, though, to assess whether your attitudes about work help or hinder you in achieving your career uh, success. So the workplace has certainly changed a lot, even in just like the last 20 years or so. Um, there's a lot of technological advances that have really revolutionized 
the way that we work, where we work, how often we work, um, what our work looks like. Um, for instance, many employees use email and mobile technology uh, to communicate with uh, their bosses or other employees. And so this kind of creates like these weird norms um, where our personal lives and our professional lives kind of started to blend together. And so some people refer to this as like the electronic leash. Um, so the idea that your boss can get a hold of you at like any time or your uh, coworkers can be working well into the day or night. Um, so it can make it difficult to separate from work uh, when you're always able to be contacted uh, via these different technological methods. Um, and this can cause stress. We can get calls and emails at any time of day or night, even on vacation. Um, I have a friend that works for a, a company that I probably shouldn't say, um, but she was on vacation in Hawaii and her boss actually called her and told her that she needed to come back to work because they had an important task to do. So she left her uh, Hawaii vacation early to go back to work. Um, so it's important to set boundaries with your employer if possible. Um, and then also just like sitting at a computer all day can have a negative physical impact on your body, of course. Um, but an increasing number of people are working from home and telecommuting. Uh, which there's a lot of pros to that, you know, working from home saves time and money um, on commuting, uh, saves time and money on like getting ready and buying work clothes. You have greater flexibility. So if you need to like take your kids to soccer, you can. Um, however, if you like to interact with people, this can be isolating. Um, there can be more distractions at home, which can make it difficult to get your work done or done on time. Um, and if you need structure to be productive, then working at home can be a little problematic because you just have so much freedom. All right, for lecture activity two, I want you to tell me if you would want to work from home, why or why not. If you already do work from home, what do you like or dislike about it? Uh, so give me two to three sentences on that, and that's it for lecture activity two. Okay, so changing careers in midlife um, is becoming more and more common. So being aware of career options is a great asset to have, especially at your midlife. But really, you know, people will change careers, uh, not just at midlife, but it is becoming more common um, for both men and women to change their careers at, at midlife. Um, for example, like a woman might return to college or go back to work after her kids graduate high school. And then there are other cases where people might feel stuck in their jobs and ask themselves whether their personal dissatisfaction at work outweighs the financial rewards. And there's all kinds of examples of people that uh, leave a high paying job or a high status job to do something more meaningful. But quitting your job is difficult. Uh, research shows that the longer you stay unemployed, the harder it is to find a job. Having those like gaps uh, in your employment on your resume doesn't look good. Um, you might lose motivation um, while you're off work and you might lose confidence in your abilities while you're off work. But it's scary to quit your job and to do something else, um, especially when you have that security that you're used to. And uh, for people that have families, um, quitting their job can just be terrifying. So it's really important to um, like weigh the pros and cons of sticking with your job or quitting your job, but um, keeping in mind that your happiness is also very important, not only for you, but for your relationships, for your family, for your health. Um, so it's important to keep all of that in mind when considering leaving a job that you're not happy at. Um, but attitudes and fears about changing careers that are left unquestioned and unexamined actually make the change much harder. So it's good to kind of check in with yourself throughout your career and ask yourself, uh, how are you doing? How do you feel about this job? How do you feel about your coworkers? How do you feel about the place? Uh, while you have a job, should you start looking for another job? Um, how do you feel about people that change careers? How would you feel if you changed careers? And just kind of check in with yourself periodically so that you don't, you know, find yourself like disgruntled or in a really bad place um, or, you know, having been let go and then having to look for a new job. 
um, if you can kind of stay ahead of it, that would be the ideal. All right, so let's watch a video on the seven stages of career change. When everything's going smoothly in your career, your job can have a positive impact on your self-esteem, personal development, and general well-being. At times like this, you feel fulfilled, you feel rewarded, and challenged in a good way. Many of your friends and colleagues seem to be in the same boat, and you feel content. You're progressing well and moving forward in your career. Whether it's because of the steady paycheck or the foundations you're laying for the next promotion, you feel comfortable with how things are going. But at some point, the status quo can lead to doubt. Is this really how you want to spend your time? Are you making the most of your skills and potential? Maybe you're working too many hours focused on projects that aren't as meaningful as they used to be. Either way, something's not right. If you don't find anything to ease those nagging doubts, it won't be long before the thought of Monday mornings makes you miserable. You're going through the motions, watching the clock, and you're no longer proud of what you do. But you're a determined person. You pride yourself in not quitting, and you won't give up without a fight. You try to make some changes to make your days at work more tolerable. And while those superficial changes make things a little better for a while, it's only a matter of time before that feeling of being in the wrong place comes back. You might even distract yourself from your day job by trying to squeeze in time to do the things you actually enjoy, channeling your energy into something you find more interesting. Whatever you do, you feel like you should stick things out at work, even if you're not completely happy. Besides, you don't really know what you would do instead. But eventually, trying to balance your true interests with your day job just means you're spreading yourself too thin. There simply aren't enough hours in the day to dedicate yourself to the side projects to offset the misery from your day job. Everyone has a line in the sand, and once your job becomes unbearable, you start to think about leaving it all behind. But leaping into the unknown is scary, especially if you don't know exactly whether things are actually going to get better. But you also know when enough is enough, when it's time to take a brave leap into the unknown in spite of your fears. Eventually, you'll reach a point where you can stop, refuel, and re-energize. You decide you need to completely detach. To take a fresh look at your options. While this stage is full of uncertainty, and the risk of making the same mistake is scary, it's a real opportunity to make a positive change in your life. and decide how you want to move forward. You may not know exactly what to do next. You may not know exactly how things will turn out. But you decide you just have to start somewhere. At some point, when you feel ready enough, you make a brave leap towards something new. To move forward in a direction that feels at least broadly right. And to figure out whatever you need to along the way. With fresh energy and purpose, you leave the choppy waters of your old career behind and launch into something new. All right, so let's talk about retirement. Uh, people experience retirement really differently. Um, some retirees may experience a void and uh, dissatisfaction, especially if they don't like have any plans for work or hobbies or leisure uh, once they retire. Retirement may need to be delayed for some people due to unanticipated financial hardships that occur later in life, uh, like getting sick, for example. So it's important to plan for retirement in advance, both financially and in terms of how you're going to spend your time. Other people become actively involved in recreation, community affairs, volunteer work, or uh, new ventures. A good way to kind of assess how your retired life will look is to uh, look at how you spend your leisure time while you are working. Um, so some people, you know, relax by doing easy work tasks at home. Some people may party heavily at the end of the week to deal with the stresses of work. Uh, people with desk jobs may exercise to stay physically active. 
But generally what you do for leisure while you work spills over to what you will do as a retired person. So that's kind of a good glimpse into how you're going to look as a retiree. Uh, retirees may feel a loss of status over no longer having a professional role. This is especially true for retired people that held powerful positions. Uh, they may no longer get the attention and special treatment that they used to get, and this can be difficult for people that are used to getting like a lot of adoration to no longer be in the spotlight. So um, there's good news, though. People can view retirement as a new beginning by keeping themselves vital um, in terms of being physical, psychological, spiritual, and social beings. So kind of staying active in life and not disengaging is a good way to be happy during retirement. Um, there's five retirement paths, um, and those are people called continuers, adventurers, searchers, easy gliders, and retreaters. So continuers are retirees that use their skills and interests to really do more of the same activities they did in their previous work, but they just modify those activities to fit retirement. And then the second group of people are called adventurers, and they look for new things to learn and do. They kind of try to create a new path for themselves. Uh, maybe they were an accountant and they always wanted to be a painter, so now they're trying that. Sorry, that's my daughter. She's watching Paw Patrol and freaking out. Oh, but see, that's what we were talking about earlier, distractions when you're working from home. It's a real thing. Um, plus, she's, like, so cute. It's very distracting. Um, but anyways, the next uh, type of retiree is called a searcher, and these are people that look for new activities using trial and error. Uh, they try a new hobby, and then they find that they aren't so into it, so they try something else new. Um, so they're just kind of searching, trying out different things, um, as they go through the retirement process. And then the next type of retiree is called the easy glider. And they value their newfound freedom. They go with the flow. They like being unscheduled. And they just choose activities that interest them as they kind of pop up. And then the next group are called retreaters. Um, and these people have kind of given up on creating, learning, or experiencing anything new. And sadly, they often feel detached from life. So... This is kind of the least desirable of the five retirement paths. All right, that is it for Chapter 10. So make sure you submit your lecture activities and also do the assignments um, that correspond with this chapter. And we will see you for the next one. Have a great day.